Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? Today, we are going to be talking about the importance of women-centered questions in the classroom. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. So Brooke, last time we sat down, we were talking about feminist pedagogy and strategies that teachers can use in the classroom to make girls feel like they belong. And it's not just about liking girls. It's about building an inclusive classroom. Building an inclusive classroom. Okay. Okay. So one of the crazy things that I am finding about trying to incorporate more women's history into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So there's this additive step, right? Like you're teaching a unit on insert your favorite topic here and you're not going to find, and I blame history.com for this problem. (laughs) Um, I feel like 90% of what we do on this, in this organization is correcting the myths perpetuated by history.com. Oh no. But if you Google something, they usually are the first hit. So like American revolution, right? And read their article I guarantee you there are very few women mentioned in that article about the American Revolution. Frustrating. Right? How frustrating. But then what's crazy is that if you add, just add one more thing, women in the American Revolution, suddenly tons of resources become available to you. And even history.com has stuff on that, right? They just don't integrate it into the main article about the American Revolution. So it's... You know, this like subcategory. Right. Um, and the same is true. Like if you want to, if you want to include more African-Americans or Chinese Americans, like just add, think about who you're missing. That's step one. And then add that to your search terms. And suddenly you will find so much about that topic because people are writing about it. And it's like, it's out there. It, this is not like brain, you know, rocket science. <laughs> like you just need to add those, those words to your searches. And, and, you know, we've been doing professional development with teachers for the last two summers. And, um, it's just like the, you know, the world opens when I say, okay, now add women to your search terms. (laughs) It's, it's pretty, it's pretty mind boggling. So what I think is interesting and why this is so important, you know, in thinking about inclusivity, when you see yourself in the space, it's like, oh, I belong here. Right. Right. And I think the like there's so many like subtle messages uh, that we can provide students that are gendered about their belonging, both in our classroom, in this career as historians, which we were talking a lot about last time. And then the next step is also like in whatever topic you're talking about. So if you're talking about the economy and all of the examples are about male labor movements, right? right? That labor movements that intentionally excluded women. Yeah. Mind you, if you're talking about, you know, politics and leadership and you don't talk about the roles that women played in those things, you're subtly telling them over and over and over again, you don't belong in these things. And I think it takes a really strong person to push back against that and kind of like, not be hindered by not seeing themselves in that space. Yeah, it's hard. And I think there's probably a lot of opportunity to do things that'll bring them in and and show examples of them. But it's also what is, you know, you were talking about building questions from jump that are inclusive. Yeah. So, I mean, if you can do that, that's step one. Step one. (laughs) Right. I know. So the other day I had my kids, I'm training now for my big race this summer. And I was in the, I was in the gym running on the treadmill and they had these three TV screens all playing three different channels of sports stuff. And I was there for about an hour running on this treadmill. And in that entire hour, not, oh, sorry. Right at the end, the WNBA came on for six seconds. I shit you not. Like I counted, I counted. I was like, one, two, and they're gone. And that was it. So, so an hour of being there and I got six seconds of women 
displayed in a sports context yeah, on three that. different channels. And it was just, it was kind of an interesting example to me of like, why don't women feel like they belong in gyms sometimes? Like, you know, like, <laughs> One let, example. Let me tell you, <laughs> because you don't show them there. And even they had like a panel talking about the Super Bowl coming up, you know, and like the entire panel was male. So like women can't talk about the Super Bowl. They're not qualified to do that. Like, and some you know, of the best female newscasters for sports are part of football. Yeah. It's like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's so, it's so interesting to me. And, uh, you know, and that's just like a... It's a small example. It's a small example of the larger problem. And so when you're talking about history, like it's this sense of, you know, like, do, do women belong in this world outside of our classrooms? Like that, like that's a subtle messaging. Yeah. Or the lack of importance. Like I can remember growing up and being like, why isn't the women's U.S. soccer team on TV right now. Like, they're playing a game. Like, I have their schedule. And yeah. this is back when you couldn't get every channel. I know, kids. Th that was, like, a time period. <laughs> um, couldn't get it on YouTube. And I'm, like, sitting there with my dad. I can remember this. And I was, like, so pissed. And they had, like, some Euro soccer team on. And I was, like, well, I guess they're cool. I guess I'll watch this. But the, the team I wanted to see was being bumped because there was a male program. And now we know the U.S. women's soccer team brings in way more money than, right. they, than their male counterparts in advertising and in viewership. So put them on. Put them on TV. Put, put so, them on. But it's also, that's such a small example of like how equity shows up in our media, but it's also U.S.-based persuasion and perspective. But it's hard. I think for students, they're bombarded with that all day, every day outside of your classroom. Well, and I think importantly in your classroom, too, like schools are not innocent of perpetuating these gendered expectations. And, yeah. you know, not just gender, but like insert, you know, social expectations from the society outside. Schools need to be should be better right than than the society outside. Well, if that's if the goal is to educate so that the future is different, like, then do that. <laughs> you know, educate. So and I, I think there are, might be some people listening to say like, oh, that's not our job. Like our job is not to change society. It's just to teach people about society. And it's like, well, then we'll your, let's go back your to <laughs> job is to prepare every child, every child yeah. in the space for college, career, and civic life. Those three terms come from the National Council for the Social Sites, college, career, and civic life. So if you are sending girls the message that they have not, there's nothing that they can do with a degree because all the people who are shown to have importance and hold those degrees are invaluable, then you're telling her she doesn't need a college degree. So yeah. she's not prepared for that. If you're telling her that she's there are no careers subtly that she can be in because you don't show women in careers, yeah. you know, in, in your classroom, then you're not preparing her for career. And if you're talking constantly about men in politics, right, if you're talking constantly about men in power, if you're talking constantly about men's movements, you know, and, and talking about political movements that we all know included women, but you're not talking about their inclusion, then women have no place in civic life. And so those are the three responsibilities of a social studies teacher. And it's to all of the students in the classroom. Yep. So, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky. College, career, and civic life, those three things. N note that, like, domestic servitude is not one of the things that we are preparing students for <laughs> in our social male or female male or female right like there are other classes for that um those are and i'm not trying to diminish those things those are nope. very important life skills but that's not the role of the social studies classroom right you guys take on is there any other topics or subjects that take on the civic piece because i don't think that's true uh, any other subjects? No, I mean that's our responsibility. Like I mean, we are. That's a lot of pressure. You're tasked with, and maybe this relates to why our society has some challenges today. But you're tasked with basically energizing and you know, and, and encouraging and educating around politics. No one other subject really is. Yeah. And there's a deep challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like in itself, not only world politics and global perspective, but also U.S.-based as well. And so 
if you're not showing an equitable experience, if women aren't in that one topic, yeah, you can now see why we're having some of the challenges in today, yeah, or in our global communication strategies. And it all comes back down to that one history class or the two or three that you get in high school. I mean, it's crazy. Like, and I think about this all the time. Uh, you know, as I'm teaching my pre-service students, you know, who are who are off to become teachers, I thought about this every day in my job that like only 30% of people graduate college in four years. 30%. So if you have a college degree, you are an intellectual elite by definition because you're like <laughs> in the top, you know, in the top whatever in, in, in terms of degrees. And granted, like that's not the end all be all of intellectualism, but but that's just like, that's so fascinating to me. And so what that means for high school is that 70% of the people in that space may never go on to get a college degree. So what you do by the end of 12th grade is what 70% of our population are going out into the world with. Now, granted, are there many different avenues for learning outside of a traditional classroom? Of course there are. Like, are they going to learn some of this stuff, you know, in, you know, pop culture and whatever, but like Hollywood is not accurate history, like 90% <laughs> of the time, right? Um, Hollywood is, you know, and, and the media is not necessarily, you know, TikTok and, and politicians, they like, they are trying to often persuade you towards a political perspective. And, sure. and so like, that's not the best place to like really neutrally look at information, political information that's being presented to you um, and have, you know, inspired debates rather than like established debates where people are calm and being respectful of one another yeah. rather than like, you know, with your uncle at Thanksgiving, you know, like that <laughs> sort of thing. So yeah, it, civil it, discourse and being able to be a critical thinker is a whole piece of your class too, is like you're giving... Sometimes you're trying to break brains a little bit like, oh, you you think you know this perspective, X, Y, Z let me show you what you missed. And then you're like filling in, like you have this like little beautiful photo and then you're like, but you're missing a bench and there's a tree. And now here's this, yeah, you didn't see before and you're pulling them all forward to the foreground. And someone's like, crap, I was looking at the wrong picture the whole time. And, yeah, and it's you're asking not- kids to do that. You're asking them to look deeper and say, is this real? Is this factual? Where's it coming from? Are there other opinions? And just be a natural, scientific, critical thinker. Yeah. And I think one of the, you know, weird perspectives about teaching is that the teacher is somehow this like all-knowing being who is informing their class. But one of the coolest things, and if you ask like any teacher, is that a lot of times these new perspectives come organically from their peers right. too. I come from my background. You come from your background. The kids in the classroom come from whatever background they have. And you can have really power. You know, like one of the most powerful discussions I ever had was these two kids debating the New Deal in class, Mm -hmm. you know, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And they both were on hot lunches at school. Like they both got free and reduced lunch. And, you know, they were willing, comfortable enough to share that and willing to talk about it in the classroom. And it just like, it was so cool because it was re- the new deal all of a sudden became real for them right yeah. and like i can't provide that perspective i was never on a hot lunch program at school they brought that and what, what was really interesting was they had really different views on that program well the other piece of it that you're not highlighting and i'll highlight for you is you created a space comfortable enough for students to show up and share their journey which is really challenging and i think for them to feel confident to do that in your classroom and then feel safe enough with each other to debate thoughtfully. Yeah. You created that environment. Yeah. That's a big piece of it. I think part of what you're talking about too, is that you're trying to give space for these thoughtful debates. You're trying, and that helps you build that civic community, like-minded member and all these things. But your job as a teacher is also not to always give your opinion too. I think history teachers do this really well. Every great history teacher that I've ever spoken to and had the joy of meeting through this experience, but also in my own life, they throw the things out there. Yeah. They're kind of like these parade candy moments. They're like, here's some parade candy. Pick it up if you want to, you know, and like they don't put their opinion on it. There's no lens. And they're like, yeah, tell me more. Why, why do you think that? And you pull them forward and you're bringing them through. And it's like, you could say that, but what are you backing it up with? And you're challenging them to, 
voice their opinions and you're doing this really well. I, I can remember four or five history teachers I had. I never knew their political stance. Like yeah. never knew what party they were affiliated with. Had no idea where they were in their voting status or like what they were swaying towards, liberal or not. And I always thought that was really great about them. And the ones that we've met through this podcast too, like they just show up and present the facts. They're yeah. like, here's the facts. Take them, take them and debate them and let me bring in some more facts. And yeah. here's some other facts. Yeah. <laughs> like do the, do the analysis, pull it apart. Yeah. I, I mean, that is like, I think one of the best compliments a teacher can get is like, I don't really know what your political stance is on generally, you know, maybe on a particular issue you could guess or something, but like, I, I think that's a really powerful, powerful tool. I think that the tricky thing is I would like to challenge teachers to, as they're throwing out the parade candy, as you call it, <laughs> to think about gender as a, per, a piece of candy that you can add into the mix. I think post, you know, 2020, a lot of us are doing, thinking about things through that racial lens and we should be. You know, when we think about inclusion, it's not additive, it's like a multiplier, right? right because exactly. the moment you add in gender, it's not just women. Now you have to think about the same things. Like, you know, take that New Deal topic. We have to talk about the New Deal from a gendered lens. You know, my class already did a really good job of looking at that from a racial lens and yep. how New Deal programs were racist towards people. But now let's look at this through a gendered lens. And so when you, the moment you add that gendered lens in, we're looking at not only the women who were involved in Franklin Roosevelt's cabinet right? Um, at the elite level, we're looking at how these policies were discriminatory against yep. women just as much as they were against African Americans. There weren't, you know, the CC, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps was not open to women. It was not an option for them to be a part of it. Created all of these jobs, yep, but not, uh, not one, for women, not one for single moms, not one for young women who were independent of their families or orphan, you know, women or whatever. Like, yep. like th that was not an option for them. Um, in, in fact, worse, in 1932, they passed a law that required the federal government to fire married women whose spouse was also employed by the federal government. Because you're benefiting once. You can't benefit twice. Yeah. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. <laughs> you know, so like, you know, check that out. It's called the Economy Act. So like, okay, you're adding in that layer. And then, okay, so you've, you've looked at how the New Deal impacts elite women and then, you know, like yep. working class women. But then now we have to add in race, yep. you know, social status, sexuality on the women's side, right? So like... And you could do that on the men's side as well. It's like, how is this affecting... Yeah. single dads yeah. so, you know you can you can go down that rabbit hole too and it's like you're trying to add in all of the color of the painting that you're trying to paint and it's like do we have all the facts yeah. are we missing any lens that we should be talking about and like your students can be sitting there like man i did not think this topic was this big and it's like well it is They're, these are this is one policy that affected everyone in different ways it wasn't just one effect like because if you look at that and you only have the one story that you get from your history text. It's a great thing. It saved America. And you're like, did it? <laughs> saved white America for sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and I, I also should add in there, like, just because these policies are discriminatory against women, when you think about, like, the way that it privileged white men, that also means that it privileged white families right. and women benefited from, <laughs> white women benefited right. from that, Right. It just gets increasingly more complex. And I think I, I can hear teachers listening right now being like, holy shit, I have so much to cover in my curriculum. <laughs> Are you joking right now? You want me to multiply? Well, it's like taking a piece of popcorn and, and then putting it on the fire and it becomes a current, you, know, yeah. you know, a kernel into a popcorn. And now you do like four of those. And you're like, shit, there's a yeah. whole bowl of popcorn. I got to feed these kids. Yeah. Out. And you're just like, I don't know how to get this to and them I fast enough. I think that's where the skills of a teacher come in. Because 100%. the moment you start posing these types of questions, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you are a lecture-based teacher, you can't do it. You Like you will not be able to do this because... You are going to basically, the New Deal, it, these are a set of programs that were passed during well, like, the Great Depression. Yeah, and check 
did the new deal moving on like no one's checking that balance or that you know the equity of that right but if you're a thoughtful approach to it. You're doing discussion-based learning and critical thinking. And but you split but them up into groups. It's like, okay, you take gender, you take yeah. sexuality, you do this. Now bring your perspective. You're representing your party yep. and you're coming into the New Deal. Per- like you could do right. so many really but creative what, things. What to that you topic. just illustrated is what I'm trying to say. You decentralized the classroom. Yeah. That's what you did. You, you empowered the students in the space. And that's what we're talking about in feminist pedagogy in our in our previous conversation about how to do what we're talking about. You cannot command the space and cover all of these bases. It's yeah. not possible and it, to do it well. And it's way more powerful when it comes from the students themselves. So you give them the sources. Let yep. them read from that single black mother during the Great Depression. Let yep. her let her speak. 85% of socialized teachers are white anyway. So like stop white person trying to give <laughs> voice to black people. Let black people from the past speak for themselves, right? Yeah. Let students read from those voices. And like you said, yeah, you could do it a million ways. Break them up into groups. You could use, you know, a DBQ or, you know, one of the inquiries that we have on our oh, website. Gosh, yeah. And like all of that decentralizes it. You stop being the expert. You give them your two seconds on what the heck the New Deal was and then let them run wild with the popcorn and the kernel and the pop, what did you call it? The (laughs) parade candy. Parade candy. When I would build my lesson plans for, I was an English teacher, so sorry for English teachers, but I would bring in the topic that we're talking about for the day and I would think about five pieces of parade candy that I wanted to throw out in the class to keep them engaged, excited, and that they would walk away with because before they left my classroom that day, I would be like, what did you learn today? What's one thing that you liked about today's lesson? Or what was one thing that you're going to take away from this today? And I'd make them go around and at least get five or six of them to say it. Because when your parents at night, what did you learn today at school? Yeah. (laughs) Right. There's a thing from from Miss Tanker's classroom. I got this little braid candy. Yeah. And it was that was more to engage the students. But I thought about it in a way of like, I'm not leading i'm just facilitating i'm facilitating. i'm just bringing the things to the table and i'm bringing the parade candy you can decide to pick it up or not yeah and you can decide to take it with you or not or you can leave it right here yeah like i think that's the hard thing with history teachers too is like you're bringing all these perspectives in and at the end of the day the kids get to decide your students get to decide what goes with them and what they take forward and not to add like a whole other element to this but i'm getting a lot of ads right now that are Trying to deprofessionalize education. And, you know, you would think that COVID taught the world. Like, like teachers are so necessary. Teachers are so necessary. And what we do is more complicated than recording an asynchronous video of ourselves and slapping it up on the internet. <laughs> but, like, it, it is mind-boggling that these ads exist. And I think we have, like, if you can record yourself... And call that teaching. And if it can be, if you feel like you just walk in and replay every day. then Or that you can pull that out every year and and, and just do the know, same thing. Same thing, same thing, same thing. And I not think, take in any new discovery. I think that that is a problem. And, and teaching is more complicated than just like walk in and recite and then walk out. Like it is a interaction. Never again will your students have the opportunity to sit down in a space, especially if you teach in a public school with people of such different socioeconomic yeah. backgrounds from them. I taught in a in a really pearly white district in rural New Hampshire where like if you looked at the room, you'd be like, oh, these kids are the same. And it's like, no, even in that space, we had such variety, such such difference. And, you know, like inclusion and diversity are, are more complicated than race. And I have to like teach my students that all the time. Um, even though that is obviously a huge, huge important lens. It's to it. true for workforces, though, too. People are like, when when companies come to me and they'll be like, I really want to build a really diverse team. Like, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Like, I always throw it back to them. And they're like, well, you know, we're mostly a homogenous group. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and they're like, mostly white guys. And I was like, are you? Like, y- you present white but you might have two gay dads. You yeah. might have, like, everyone's got journeys. So diversity isn't just race. Yeah. And, like, if you're saying you want more racial diversity on your team, okay. Yeah. But what diversity and inclusion really means and why it's important is not about 
the race and those pieces, those are a piece of it. What it's really about is diversity of thought. Yeah. So everyone's got a different journey. Their perspectives are going to be different. The way they show up in the world is different. And that's what you want. You want diversity of thought. And so I'm constantly doing this in the workforce of like, people are like, I love diversity and inclusion. I'm like, oh my God, okay, why? (laughs) Yeah. What does that mean to you? Let's pull it apart. Because people will really deeply live in like racial diversity. And while that is a piece of it, you have to go beyond that. Well, and also like seeing diversity of black thought. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, like it's not black there. women are diverse in mo- like everyone's journey is different. White yeah. women are it's like everyone's got a journey and an experience like first gen, single parenting, d- k- child of divorce, child of sexual abuse. Like everyone's got a journey that makes them come and show up in a way that's different than yours. And it's diversity and inclusion becomes really critical in the workforce to bring more perspectives to the table. And it's the same thing in the classroom is like you want diversity, but diversity is not just one flat surface. It is yeah. multiple things. And it can be multiple things, even from kids from similar like backgrounds. It's like they're going to sh- come with different perspectives. And from a pedagogic perspective, like the important thing, is, I'm not just trying to like threaten teachers. Like there are people out there who think that they can record a couple of videos and replace you. So you really <laughs> need to be a facilitator and like do the work of getting your kids to engage in these really important topics in a safe space that they will not 70% of them will not have again because they're off into the workforce and the next debate they have will be with their uncle at Thanksgiving like <laughs> yeah give them some tools give them some tools to like have these conversations and, and you know be prepared for college career and civic life and all of them And all of these people, every one of them, male, female, queer, whatever, like they are going to grow up and live in a world where women exist. So you better be asking questions about (laughs) gender in that classroom because all of them are going to think about relationships with, you know, and even if they're, you know, not in relationships with women, like all of them are going to grow up and have relations with women at work at, you know, in their family, they might have a sister, whatever. And how are they going to treat those people? Right. How are they going to value those people outside of your classroom? It is a multiplier. It's not just an added one. It's not just like add a woman in. It's the moment you do that, the whole thing blows up and expands and that is beautiful and you need to embrace it. And part of that embracing is changing the way you do your classroom. Yeah. I think there's probably a lot of people that listen to our podcast that are already doing this this amazing work and are, are working at their own craft in a way. They probably have some peers that are really challenging that maybe like pull out the textbook and do the thing from the thing and write the, you know, that are unwilling to change. And I think that's really hard as a colleague to have this vibrant, beautiful, inclusive classroom that you're building. And then they go to the next level and it's like, womp, womp. Yep. I also, you know, it's one of those things too, is if you spark these fires and if your students go on to that next classroom that isn't as inclusive as yours, They're going to be asking those hard, challenging questions of that teacher that is not doing the thing. And you're changing. You're changing an environment. You're asking more of your peer is going to. And it was funny. I was talking to someone at one of our history conferences we went to. And they're like, I have two peers that are ready to retire that are asking me to help break their lesson plans and build them again with them. And it's like, yes, that's awesome. This is the thing. Like you're doing the thing. And I think that's that's what we're trying to do a little bit with our podcast but and, and the work that we're doing. But it is, I think the teacher that's listening to this is typically of of the cloth that we are of, you know. Yeah. But they're also being tasked with their peer group. But I think they're also like, just because you want to do the work and you're open to the work and you're tuning in and listening to this. It doesn't mean it's not overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. I, I mean, the the problem is, you know, it's it's a consciousness raising, right? And the the thing that sucks about becoming more conscious oh, okay. is that the moment you can see it, the moment you can't, that's when you can't unsee it. Yeah, and then because like for me now it's like, holy crap! I see gender, I see race. It's not just black people. It's like, oh, well, shit. Like, do we have any Chinese people in our curriculum? And like, do we have, like, <laughs> like what about, what about the Native Americans? Like, where are they at? And like, oh my God. And then it's like, and then it's like, oh my God, it's just bigger and bigger and bigger. And it is 
I, I want you to know, like, I am right there. I teach modern world history. I have to cover every single freaking continent in my classes. I don't envy you. That's one, a long day. This is one semester. Those poor students. One semester. They probably walk out of there in a cold, cold sweat. Years. I'm, I'm in a cold sweat, like, 90% <laughs> of the time, because I'm like, oh, my God. They're like, oh, it's Professor Eckert again. I'm just going to cry in, in the fetal position in the corner yeah. from the unknowing. <laughs> right. And, I mean, the reality is, like, I don't, I don't cover like you know i don't cover all of that no and, but i think and, you're trying to spark curiosity too for students doing yeah. their own self-investigations and that's part of it as well as you're you're trying to build growth mindsets and perpetual learners at the same time that you're offering perspective and consciousness it's like whenever you travel you always learn something you didn't know and then you you know yeah you become of the perspective of i know nothing yep. <laughs> you know we met a gentleman at one of our conferences that we were vending at and um he said I can't find anything on women in oh, X those are my period. Favorite people that walk up to you, you're like, it, it's literally like throwing a match in lighter fluid that's lit. And whenever someone's like, I can't find anything on women, Kelsey's like, let me tell you. Google it. Because I think like that's the thing that like drives me nuts. Like is they come I to you like open hand, like fix that for me, and you're like just figure it out man like yeah. got this no but it, it's like that's the thing is the trick is there is no trick google it add the word woman Win. <laughs> to your search here's the hack here's hack the, hack. the and you'll find it i mean not only will you find our website but you'll find a bunch of other websites <laughs> there's, there's also shit out about. there yeah. there's so much out there and you know i i to to give credit to the people that are not finding things this is recent most of totally. the books, like, you know, I found this great book on women in the Mexican-American War. It's such a good book. It was published in like 2017. So if you were, you know, in college, pre-2017. Well, and if you, you already built your lesson plans for those subjects and been teaching them for a couple of years, yep. you forget sometimes to go look for new material. And I yeah. think that's one of the things. So what's your advice for teachers right now when they're going into their next school year? Should they Google every topic they have? And like, <laughs> no. where do you where do you no, start? No, no, no. I think that you know, every summer break, I read a book about my subjects that I teach. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in high school, I read one psych book because I taught psych. I read one book on U.S. history and one book on world history because I I can't just sit at the beach all summer. I don't know. You can like, and sometimes sometimes the books are fun. Like I read historical fiction or you know whatever. And like, listen, Kelsey, keep it light. teachers need a break. They do need. I'm trying to read. They do, no, they do deserve a break. But I think also like the more the funny thing is the more seniored the teachers are, the less prepping they're doing because they already have the stuff. And so well, they like, probably have lots of stuff too. It's not like they just have, you know someone who's 20 years in. They've got printouts for days. Yeah. Those do. people come to the copy machine. They're not messing around. They've yeah. got something from 1992 that they're ready to recopy. It's not difficult. The people we're talking about are people who've been teaching for a long time and don't yeah. don't want to change. And those people, in my experience, actually have tons of time because they're not maximizing their prep periods like first and second and third year teachers are. Who are putting in like seventy hour weeks just well, to and like they exist. had to volunteer for the cheerleading club and student council and AP. Yeah, <laughs> like and they're signing up for stuff because they're like you don't have any kids. Yeah, just come over here. Come over here and do this thing, and and we're not going to pay for it. We're just going to hang out after school for the unpaid hours that you have, and then oh, when are you going to plan your classes? Yeah. After that, yeah. so don't go to bed until midnight, and then come in the next day and all during your prep periods, we're also going to send you students who didn't have time to do the stuff in the class, and you're going to handle them during that time. <laughs> oh my god, like, yeah, the overwhelm new teachers feel yeah is real i know no wonder so, they all drop out all after right five so we've years. got read read some books over the summer i think no I, I i don't don't make it some just like a book for your you know if you are one of those lucky beautiful humans who is like the u.s history teacher read one book for your subject over <laughs> the summer you know i worked in a really small school and so i had to teach a lot of subjects as a result of that yeah I'm sure you're not alone. I bet there's a lot of history teachers out there that are pretty similar. Yeah. And then I think when you're prepping your curriculum, like, you know, um, I was teaching a lesson on the Chinese Exclusion Act. And the act is really interesting and super important to history. But, you know, in the documents I was having students read and even in what I was saying to them, it's all like women, Chinese women are not immigrating to the United States. It's all these single Chinese men. And I was like, 
sitting there reading it now you know now again you can't unsee it so it's like where the hell are all these women like why are they coming you know like chinese men are coming where are the women at <laughs> and so my st- i had my students doing this little like activity with documents and so i just like, went to the back of the classroom and you know did it googled it you googled during a lesson during the lesson i know cheating <laughs> and i was like why you know why are women coming What's, you know because i'm like now I want to know. No kids ask me the question, but like, I don't know. If they do, you better have an answer. Yeah. So I Googled it. And sure enough, there's the Page Act, which is an act that was passed that like basically accused all. It was trying to prevent prostitutes coming from China to like the gold rush to, you know, to San Francisco and whatever. But it was also like preventing, acu- essentially accusing all Chinese women of being prostitutes. If and they, they, if they came. Yeah. And they had to like, you know, b- submit themselves basically to these like really invasive you know gynecological exams at, at the at the border and and like you know okay i wouldn't come either you know i get it and so <laughs> yeah, like, i'm out so I, it made sense and i was like oh and then you know ta-da there's a lesson plan about it Light on bulb. our website um, that for you, students that you can use and that that entire lesson plan came about because i sat in the back of the class and i just asked a woman-centered question why weren't Chinese women coming to the United States during the gold rush? Fascinating. And after. And so it took me five minutes building a lesson. And you could do the same thing of why didn't trans people come? (laughs) Why didn't you could go down the rabbit. Why weren't Canadians helpful? You know, yeah. Where are all the things? Why were Canadians? I don't know. Helpful? I'm just like throwing out. Like you could, are you could go down. Are Canadian now? No, A. They're great. A. Um, <laughs> no, but you could go. What I'm saying is you could go down any rabbit hole of any yeah. category of human and ask that question. And we should be doing it really specifically around women to make sure we're building those inclusive classrooms. So let's do it. Deal. I'm going to go read some books. Great. Well. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.